Welcome to the second in a series of videos looking at the creative ways in which Bojack Horseman uses perspective, time, and medium. What's a time medium? If you haven't already, I highly recommend you watch part one first, as some of the points covered in this video will expand on ideas from there. To recap, the Bojack writers tend to build each episode around a central idea, or what John Truby calls a designing principle, which he describes as the internal logic of the story, what makes the parts hang together organically so that the story becomes greater than the sum of its parts. In this video, I'll be examining the designing principles behind three more Bojack episodes to show how the duration and sequencing of a story's events can be used to convey theme. Today's topic is time. Several Bojack episodes adhere to what interpreters of Aristotle call unity of time, whereby a story's events are confined to a period of no more than 24 hours. This was first attempted in Season 2's After the Party, and later returned to in Season 5's Planned Obsolescence, with both episodes examining three different relationships over the course of a single evening. Season 3's Best Thing That Ever Happened restricts things even further, combining this with unity of place for an intimate half-hour confrontation between Bojack and Princess Carolyn at his restaurant. Well, this night has been a disaster. But my favourite example of this technique is in the series finale, Nice While It Lasted, which allows an incarcerated Bojack one day of freedom to attend Princess Carolyn's wedding. If the view from halfway down was a meditation on death, this episode is a celebration of life, with the synopsis simply reading, A celebration brings people together. In terms of perspective, this is essentially the opposite of a quick one while he's away in that it focuses solely on the main cast. They are the only ones who speak throughout, with Bojack himself being the only constant. As a result, there's very little external conflict here, just real, honest friendships as we get to watch Bojack interact with each of these characters one last time. The designing principle for this episode could be, through four one-to-one -one conversations with his closest friends, Bojack experiences a perfect day and discovers the joy of living in the present. As this is the finale, each of these conversations has a lot of loose ends to tie up, but one idea that keeps resurfacing is the internal conflict that comes from worrying about the future instead of appreciating the present. We first see this during the scene with Mr. Peanut Butter, who kindly collects Bojack from prison and tries to calm his apprehension of the coming evening. I just know that something bad is going to happen if I go to that wedding. How about this? We'll go to the wedding, and if you get there and you want to leave, we can leave. At the wedding, Todd shows compassion toward Bojack by inviting him outside to escape the crowd, despite all their history. He helps to quell Bojack's fears of the more distant future. I worry about what's going to happen when I get out. What if I relapse again? Then you'll get sober again. Later, Bojack and Princess Carolyn act out his imaginary, sitcom-esque scenario that would have seen her get cold feet before the wedding. Through this, we learn that she too is plagued with doubts about the future, but this time it's Bojack who offers words of comfort. Maybe don't worry about whether you'll be happy later, and just focus on how you're happy right now. So far, Bojack's friends have appeared in order of increasing closeness to him, so it makes sense that we finish with Diane, who knows him better than anyone. It turns out that the best way to round off any series is a heart-to-heart -heart with Alice and Brie, and this one certainly doesn't disappoint, harking back to the ending of season one where the pair discuss similar existential issues. Well, that's the problem with life, right? Either you know what you want, and then you don't get what you want, or you get what you want, and then you don't know what you want. The solution, of course, is to Stop worrying about the future. An idea that Bojack has needed to embrace for a long time. What's promising is that even Diane, whose unhealthy habits often mirror Bojack's, seems to have managed this to some extent. How'd you learn how to trust it? The happiness. I didn't. But I trust him. But perhaps the most crucial step in overcoming such anxiety is learning to accept change. Unlike the arbitrary time span seen in most stories, the confinement of this episode's events to a single day creates a sense of impermanence, emphasising both the fleeting nature of happiness and the fact that this might be the conclusion of Bojack and Diane's friendship. Wouldn't it be funny if this night was the last time we ever talked to each other? Here, the existential dread of the uncannily photorealistic star field that's been a recurring motif throughout the season is replaced by a simple, serene night sky, as we're given a minute to enjoy being with these characters for the last time. It might only be one day, but days like this are what make life worth living. It's a nice night. Huh? Yeah. This is nice. Bojack Horseman made prominent use of flashbacks from the outset, but while early episodes typically used them for cutaway gags, the show became more judicious in its inclusion of them over time. What is this? A flashback episode? The Telescope deserves a mention for being the first episode primarily set in the past, 
and for inventing the generic throwback songs, a tradition upheld by the Bojack Horseman show, which takes place wholly in 2007. This is a pop song in 2007. Some episodes use a specific location as a bridge between the past and present. Princess Carolyn's return to her hometown in the Amelia Earhart story provides a perfect opportunity to delve into her tragic backstory, while the old Sugarman place beautifully weaves together two timelines into one gut-wrenching narrative about intergenerational trauma and the effects of loss. However, I actually want to focus here on an episode less talked about, because I think it shows just how confident Bojack had become by its final season even outside of those big emotional impact episodes. A Horse Walks Into Rehab is by far the show's strongest season premiere, with the premise being Bojack checks into Pastiches, a Malibu rehab facility, where he grapples with memories of Sarah Lynn's death and his own troubled childhood. The main storyline follows Bojack as he attempts to convince an escaped patient to return to rehab, but these events in the present mainly serve as a vehicle to remind him of his own past encounters with alcohol. The designing principle for this episode might be trace the source of Bojack's alcoholism through a series of flashbacks in reverse chronological order. Dr. Champ tries to uncover the psychological cause behind Bojack's drinking near the beginning of the episode, but his patient refuses to comply. I notice you tend to deflect whenever I ask you about the source of your addiction. I don't deflect. Hey, is that a new tie? Because I love it. The rest of the episode is about forcing Bojack to confront this psychological cause through a succession of flashbacks spiralling down into his early childhood. The first of these takes place on the set of Horsin' Around at a time when Sharona snuck vodka into his orange juice to help him relax during a scene. Oh, no, no, I don't... Trust me, it'll loosen you up. As he drinks, we see the same film burn transition that will subsequently be used throughout the season 6 title sequence, as Bojack's abstinence from alcohol allows his repressed memories to sear through into consciousness. I remember everything. I'm sober now. And sure enough, his drunken performance garners the desired audience response, spurring him on to drink more. Hey Sharona, how about some more of that OJ? Next, we're taken back to a teen house party, where an adolescent Bojack struggles to make conversation with a girl from his Spanish class. He once again refuses the offer of alcohol, but when he sees her drinking and laughing with a stereotypical jock, he decides that a beer will provide a shortcut to the confidence he needs. As in the previous flashback, Bojack is proven right, as his offensive, drink fueled stand-up performance earns him respect among his peers. With each of these events, his positive associations with alcohol are reinforced, and our understanding of his addiction becomes ever clearer. The third flashback shows an even younger Bojack walking in on Butterscotch and his secretary. When Butterscotch pours him a drink, it seems as though we're witnessing an unusual moment of bonding between the pair. But when Bojack wakes up in the car after having thrown up on his dad's carpet, Butterscotch makes his true intentions apparent. Maybe it's best if we both just forgot about everything that happened tonight. This event may well have introduced Bojack to the idea of using alcohol to repress unpleasant memories a habit that he is only now beginning to shake. I won't forget this, Dad. I will. The final flashback appears to resolve one of Dr. Champ's queries from the start of the episode. Maybe you could tell us when was the first time you drank. When wasn't the first time I drank? While these questions are posed through the dialogue, they are answered through the episode structure. Just as a quick one while he's away juxtaposed several subplots to highlight a common theme, this sequence of flashbacks outlines the repeated conditioning that Bojack has been subject to from an early age, causing his ideas of alcohol and interpersonal connection to merge into one. While flashbacks are usually treated as interruptions of a single, main timeline, Chronology gets a little more complicated when it comes to true non-linear narrative. This is a much freer structure in which the past, present and future intertwine, and as such, it often requires some overarching element to hold it all together for the audience's understanding. You mix all the flashbacks together with the present day scenes, the relationships are incomprehensible. Mr. Peanut Butter's booze condenses 25 years of his repeated relationship errors into four separate Halloween parties, none of which take place in January, unfortunately. Likewise, The Dog Days Are Over frames its time-hopping narrative as a girl crush listicle to express how lost Diane feels after her recent divorce. I am from America. No, me, America. You, Vietnam. No. But as brilliant as both of these episodes are, neither quite reaches the emotional heights of the season four climax, Time's Arrow, which pieces together the story of Bojack's mother from the fragments of her distorted memories. The synopsis for this episode reads, in 1963, 
young socialite Beatrice Sugarman meets the rebellious Butterscotch Horseman at her debutante party, but it's the scattered telling of these events that's garnered such critical acclaim. The decision to frame this story through Beatrice's memories is ingenious for two reasons, the first of which is explained by Truby when he writes, A storyteller is tremendously liberating when it comes to constructing the plot. Because the actions of the plot are framed by someone's memories, you can leave chronology behind and sequence the actions in whatever way makes the most structural sense. By making Beatrice the episode's unwilling storyteller, the writers provide a lens through which the audience can make sense of what they're seeing, even as Time's arrow marches all over the place. Time is like a woman, completely impossible to comprehend. The second reason is that by combining this exploration of Beatrice's mental state with non-linear chronology, the episode convincingly depicts her inability to sequence events due to dementia. Much like in Christopher Nolan's Memento, this simulation of the protagonist's cognitive disorder helps to put the audience in their shoes, which, according to Raphael Bob Waxberg, was one of his main goals throughout season four. At the time of writing, he asked himself, can we take this character that I think is widely thought of as pretty horrible, and without softening her edges, can we make our audience feel for her as well and show her own vulnerability and humanity? The designing principle, then, could be create empathy for Beatrice through a dementia-ridden account of her traumatic past. From the violent time jumps to the skewed visuals, nearly every aspect of the episode is designed to emphasise Beatrice's status as victim. The show even uses its animation style to this end, as the scrolling out of certain characters' faces conveys just how painful some of these memories are for her. One day this will all be a pleasant memory. The plot itself largely serves to recontextualise Beatrice's cruel actions. We see the chain of events that led to her bitterness, as the childhood trauma of having her doll burn prevents her from getting an abortion, thus saddling her with a baby she isn't ready for and a husband she isn't right for. But then you're not married to your secretary, are you? Well, maybe if my secretary also refused to get an abortion, I would be. The damaging belief spouted by Beatrice's father also helped to explain her behaviour without excusing it. From subtle callbacks in the dialogue... Remember what we say about crying? Mm -hmm. Crying is stupid. Don't you dare cry! Don't you ever cry! ...to some of her most evil actions such as her secret drugging of Hollyhock with weight loss supplements. So perhaps you'll finally lose some of that weight that's given you such troubles. But we also see that she is still capable of good, as she offers to pay for Henrietta's tuition and convinces her to give up her own baby for adoption. Please, Henrietta, you have to believe me. Please, don't do what I did. Lastly, this focus on empathy is reflected in Bojack's moment of kindness at the end of the episode when he sacrifices his long-awaited opportunity to say FUCK YOU, MOM in order to comfort her with a make-believe scenario. Despite not having witnessed the same events that we have, there's a sense that on some level, he knows what she's been through. Between form, structure and content, this episode is firing on all cylinders when it comes to inspiring empathy for the devil, which is precisely what makes it so impactful. Can you taste the ice cream, Mom? Oh, Bojack, it's so... delicious. As a show whose events span more than 75 years, Bojack Horseman certainly has an interesting relationship with time. While some episodes operate within a circadian narrative to emphasise the present, others draw attention to the past through flashbacks and non-linear chronology to show us how these characters became who they are. Nice writing, Shakespeare. But these temporal experiments aren't simply arbitrary. In fact, they're carefully chosen to help reinforce the designing principle at the core of each story. In the third and final part of this series, I'll be looking at how Bojack horses around with Medium to push its title character to the limits of paranoia, introspection and isolation. See you then.